Thank you for joining XR Room, which is India's first AR VR focus podcast. And today, I am really <laughs> delighted to have Mr. Ivan Elda, who has been at the forefront of immersive technology. Was earlier the lead sales and partnership for one of the pioneering companies in the AR space, where he built one of the industry's first ecosystem of AR developers and enterprises and users. He then went on to lead business development in North America for Improbably, the creator. Of spatial OS, he is currently the senior specialist for spatial computing at Amazon AWS, spearheading a go-to-market strategy and business development for all things AR, VR, MR, and real-time 3D. So, Ivan, it's a pleasure to have you on XRM Podcast. A small and humble effort here in India to kind of push drive the ecosystem because I, f- the reason I've been invested in this space is because I feel that in the next few decades, may- maybe maybe sooner. I think we we'll get into a world where our mobiles and uh, a personal computer will converge into one single wearable device, creating a world where everything physically is going to be digitized, giving you information, so you can leverage the information and build products and solutions over it. Through the the folks who I've kind of interviewed uh, on XROM regarding spatial computing, everybody has got a different version of spatial computing. Would you like to give? your definition of what spatial computing is and how it's going to impact businesses and consumers yeah no thanks for having me excited to be here um i'm pumped to see your presence in india i think india is going to be a major player uh, in the air vr space hopefully the work you're doing is going to is going to inspire those visual effects artists artists to get into this space i think it's already happening and hopefully we can accelerate it here with this conversation so definition of spatial computing um yeah spatial computing has kind of historically been an academic term i think it's becoming a bit more mainstream it was actually i saw an ongoing debate just yesterday about the using uh the word xr instead of ar vr mr um, which a lot of people use. I think I think XR is kind of becoming the acronym for spatial computing. So XR, spatial computing, is really um, a spectrum. It defines the spectrum of immersion um, from AR on one hand, uh, VR on the other, uh, MR, mixed reality, in, in the middle. Uh, personally, I think the idea that mixed reality is sort of silly. I think AR and mixed reality are sort of the same thing. You can get academic with it and define one that's a little bit different. For, for my role, we also fold in anything that's real-time 3D into spatial computing. So even, even an interactive 3D experience on your phone or on a tablet, um, it's not the most immersive, but it's still immersive. It's more immersive than a typical UI, right? And uh, it is the foundation for most AR VR experiences is real-time 3D. So that's how we include real-time 3D within the spatial computing umbrella. So thank you for like kind of describing what spatial computing is. Now, could you kind of like oh, explain how enterprise and consumers can leverage spatial computing? Yeah, absolutely. So at a higher level, the way I like to think about it is this idea of knowledge transfer and storytelling, right? Um, Today, if you're trying to transfer knowledge to a prosumer or worker about any kind of thing, right? It could be um, you're trying to train someone on how to do maintenance on a piece of equipment. And today you're watching a video, you're reading a textbook, or you're trying to do knowledge transfer to a customer about the intricacies of um, your product. It could be the intricacies of a building you're trying to sell that customer as an architect, right? Um, and that knowledge transfer is happening on in a 2D plane, right? And that's not how our brains have evolved to work as humans. So that's like at a very base level, the way I always frame it for people. And then from there, the impact of that on the neural pathways of the mind are, are incredible when it comes to the ability to retain information if you're being trained on something, uh, the ability to grasp the value of a product if you're being pitched something immersively, um, the ability to make a better design decision if you're trying to communicate design intent. I'm an engineer, you're a designer, I think mechanically, you think aesthetically, but now we can get on the same page a lot faster. So in, in the enterprise, you think about this idea of knowledge transfer at various stages of a product life cycle, if you will, right? And you think about the product life cycle, you hear, you hear it a lot in the, in the world of digital twin. You go from the creation of a thing, like the ideation of a thing in the design phase, 
out to the manufacturing of a thing in the production phase, um, out to the distribution of a thing um, in the sales and marketing phase. Um, and then there's oftentimes like an operations and maintenance or a service phase, and it comes full cycle for all around. So um, we're, there's really use cases across that full spectrum. Um, the big buckets are design and engineering, creation of things, um, you know, frontline worker assistance, helping people better, more quickly assemble things, or maybe it's training on how to assemble a thing before they go do it in the factory. And then it's, it's the distribution of the thing. So helping people sell um, and market things more effectively. And the, the the biggest use case right now for that, of course, is B2B sales. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Boeing trying to sell, you know, a new jet engine or something or a new aircraft. Uh, but we're seeing the most adoption with like e-commerce and retail. It's because these, you know, these phones all have mobile AR, AR capabilities. So the ability to put furniture in a room uh, to the consumer is happening quite, quite rapidly right now and starting to scale out with lots of uh, retail brands. So, so that's how we look at the enterprise side of things. Um, and with, with consumer, you know, we're seeing the kind of gimmicky stuff. And it's getting less and less gimmicky with Snapchat and Instagram and the filters and Spark AR author stuff. And now you're having Amazon.com. They have the whole view in your room button on Amazon.com. Uh, it's actually quite good. A lot better than I thought it was um, when I first saw we were doing it. And so that that's happening. But that's kind of the only real consumer uh, use case for AR that we're seeing. Um, I think for VR, the, the Quest is hitting a tipping point or causing a tipping point in consumer VR, uh, which is really exciting. And we're starting to see game developers actually make money. Like there's actually studios making millions of dollars now. And there, there's there was you know, for the last five years, there's always one or two breaking that multi-million dollar revenue number. But now it's dozens of companies doing it. So that to me is super exciting is that you now have developers that can make money off consumer and that's going to just cause a proliferation of content and then just create that flywheel of better content more consumers more headsets and then the flywheel goes right yeah so we're in an exciting space and i i got into this uh, ar vr space in 2015 at that point in time we built our own uh, 16 camera rig uh, uh, because one of our clients uh, asked us to kind of create uh, VR content and the only uh, available cameras over that point of time was super expensive, like the Ozos and, and the Odyssey, which you, you couldn't even get over here. So we kind of like open source mm -hmm. the platform and then we built the entire rig and Odyssey had a 12 camera rig. We added top bottom to create a complete 360 degree uh, capture. We also built our own robotic dolly and then the idea was to take it to market, the, at least the, the, the camera, and then we realized that we were too early into this ecosystem but then like you rightfully pointed out facebook the quest 2 could be that uh that product or hmd which could drive a, you know mass yeah. adoption you know and, and and they are one of the players who kind of like putting the money where the mouth is and and ready to take the hit of bringing a product which is like maybe where they are not really making a lot of profit. So there are players over here in India also, like Geo is one of the biggest telecom yeah, companies. Geo has a Facebook yeah. partnership, right? I think they, they have a headset they released. They, 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 they're launching their headset. And, and the best part about Geo is that unlike the Western counterpart who's trying to kind of like address the, the enterprise market opportunity, these guys are saying it's the, 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 it, 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 it's a family device. They're saying it is across. Yeah. It's an enterprise. It's for kids. It's for learning. It's for everyone. It's a, so, so, so the narrative is different. What, according to you, should be done to create a wider adoption or acceleration of this technology? So, yeah, let's, let's talk about Geo as a, as a case study here. And, you know, Geo going to market as a consumer device has me super nervous because you saw magic and it was the wrong move. Um, I don't know what the geo device is capable of, but I'm pretty sure it's not really capable of like truly consumer ready headset worn AR. Um, the field of view, it, I'd be shocked if it was, you know, big enough for consumers, you know, larger than 60, 70 degrees. Um, uh, the, the overall display quality, right? The, the fidelity of the content you can see. Um, there's lots of problems with displays for AR today. There's this thing called uh, the vergence accommodation problem, which is this problem with uh, waveguide optics, which I'm pretty sure is what Geo is using, is what most companies have used. Um, you know, if you're wearing this thing for long periods of time, there's a comfort factor of the headset, first off, and like the size of it, 
the, the, the form factor is a problem, the size of it, the heat factor, the battery factor. We'll see what Geo can do there. Um, but then the display, uh, the virgin's accommodation problem, you know, you have a display in front of you that's here, maybe three inches in front of your face. What's the image being projected is trying to trick your eyes that it's maybe actually 10 feet in front of you. Your eye, your, your, your brain thinks it's 10 feet. Your eye knows it's two inches and it causes this eye strain. It causes this like problem of like depth. And so until we have displays that can solve that problem, until we have AR headset displays that, um, are lightweight enough to be on a smaller form factor like glasses like what you're wearing now um i'm skeptical that consumer ar is going to take off anytime soon assuming those problems can and will be solved and you know you have companies like like facebook is being very public about how they're addressing all this stuff with their reality facebook reality labs and what i like about their approach is that they're being very transparent about their progress assuming that happens it's it's developers, 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 right? And it's a chicken or egg problem for someone like Geo. They can go ship as many headsets as they want, but there's not going to be a really compelling application or experience beyond just like a floating Netflix screen on your face. Um, it's not going to get any adoption uh, by developers and until and until there's, you know, not thousands, not tens of thousands, but you know, millions of AR devices out there um, for Geo. You're not going to developers who can be economically incentivized to go build those applications so you gotta you gotta solve this chicken or egg problem of developers um and consumer readiness and that's why you're seeing the approach that apple is taking google's taking snap's taking with going mobile first i mean it's it's brilliant and i'm hoping that apple that developers in apple i mean our developers in india and i'm sure they do are getting savvy about AR kit, AR core. That's where developers need to be building today um, to create applications, create experiences, to sort of be learning, iterating, right? And then from there, get the consumer adoption. And then you port it over to a Geo headset once Geo ships at scale and once Geo gets the form factor down. But it, the, uh, I view mobile AR as the breadcrumbs along the way towards that path of headset adoption for, for AR. That's right. consumer AR, right? Recently, PwC uh, released this report, which is called See, "Seeing is Believing," which says that in in by 2030, it, there's going to be 1.5 trillion added onto the global economy due to AR VR. So yes, there is a huge, humongous opportunity. Five that trillion? That's awesome. Can I can I can I get that report? Yeah, so one, yeah. My bosses and my boss's boss. I'm trying to convince them that they need to move faster in this space. <laughs> right. One 1.5 trillion. This was. I'm going to share share it, and now obviously I'm going to link it for my audience also. So yeah. you you are the spatial uh, computing head. Uh, at Amazon. So can you share some of your initiative works to kind of accelerate and push drive the ecosystem? So the first the first problem that every customer is facing, first bottleneck, is just creating 3D models, <laughs> getting 3D models ready for AR VR experiences. If you're uh, an engineering firm, you have an entire division of CAD designers using CAD tools, but they're they're completely disjointed from the marketing team or the training team that wants to build an AR VR training experience. So the friction point is converting CAD data into a file format that is AR VR ready. You have to go through a pretty laborious process to take that CAD data and convert it. So there's companies out there like Pixies who we partner with. Uh, they do that CAD optimization process. Um, there's companies like uh, Epic Games has the Unreal game engine. They have a service called Datasmith. They do this. Um, but but just doing that data conversion process on an on-prem workstation right at your desk can take forever we have one customer it takes them 14 hours to convert one katia file for one model car so we're helping customers take those type of applications uh containerize them right build a container so it's more of a microservice and then launch it in the cloud with what's called serverless services serverless meaning you know old paradigm you have to go on you know provision ec2 server new paradigm you can use uh, tools like lambda which is a serverless service for an event driven architecture meaning now you can just have a storage bucket an s3 bucket we call it s3 uh, s3 bucket in the cloud drag and drop cad files and then it's going to automatically spin up this whole architecture uh, with, of you know compute services with lambda to use a service like Pixies 
to quickly break down CAD files. So one example is that same customer that took 14 hours to do one CAD conversion, and now it takes them 10 minutes. Um, to creating 3D models is also um, point clouds, right? Point clouds is a way to create 3D models. Um, there's also uh, pho pho uh, photogrammetry. It's another way to create 3D models. So helping helping customers deploy those types of services to create 3D content. So that's the first big bottleneck we're addressing. Um, assuming you have your 3D workflows down pat, uh, the next problem is really um, the, the rendering or the processing of this 3D content, right? You're rendering really large 3D files, heavy CAD files of a car, of a jet engine, of an oil rig, or you're pulling in a big point cloud of a factory floor. And you're, and, and you're, you're trying to enable a workforce with phones or tablets or headsets to consume that content, but those devices just do not have powerful enough GPUs. So what's the solution? You gotta offload the rendering from the device to the cloud and stream. So it's cloud-based streaming into these devices. Um, and where it gets really cool uh, is right, some use cases require super low latency. So you can't stream from a, uh, a public cloud region. So we call them regions, right? We have regions in various parts of the country. Um, so what you have to do is stream from the edge, right? So you're seeing a lot of companies like AWS, like Microsoft Azure, uh, and like Google uh, come out with edge compute offerings. We have Outpost, Google has Anthos. Uh, we also have this thing called Snowball. Snowball Edge is a product we have that is an edge compute platform that works in a disconnected environment, which is really big in defense. And a big thing that got me into the AR, VR, or kind of got momentum for us within AR, VR is the idea of using an Outpost rack as a hub for remote rendering and streaming into these headsets and devices. Um, now, where the future, it's, it's 5G, right? 5, 5G is gonna be the key to do this streaming, to do, to do this delivery. And we have a service called Wavelength. Um, we did, we built out initially in partnership with Verizon. And Wavelength basically allows you to deploy AWS services from within the Verizon MEC network or MEC platform, MEC stands for Mobile Edge Cloud. This is what telcos are deploying to, to deliver 5G. So there's this idea of public MEC. And what they're doing is they're basically installing edge compute services from cloud vendors like us into their network um, to, to allow developers to build 5G applications easily with our with same services and SDKs and APIs we provide and then deploy it from, from the 5G platform that Verizon offers. And, you know, we have right, right now we have uh, wavelength zones in Boston, San Francisco, LA, Denver, and we're doing POC the streaming now. And it's really promising. Um, there's not the problem right now is there's not many 5G enabled headsets, uh, if any. Um, there are there are mobile devices that have 5G and we're doing tests there. And that's looking promising. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but it's going to be the adoption of or it's going to be the shipping of these headsets with 5G chips in them. It's going to be a major linchpin for the, for this stuff. And the big trend to watch there is what Qualcomm is doing. So Qualcomm, if you've heard of their Boundless XR chipset, uh, their Snapdragon platform. And uh, this is going to be the 5G chipset that the majority of headset companies adopt. And it is designed with this kind of split processing paradigm in mind, this, this remote rendering paradigm in mind where the workload can move dynamically between the headset the edge in the cloud based upon latency requirements. And what's really cool about what they're doing is not, it's not just about the rendering of the 3D graphics and that workload moving along that kind of value chain, but it's also the computer vision elements, which is super critical. So, um, you know, if I am wearing a headset and I want to do a quick real time scan of my factory floor environment to create a 3D map that can then, that then becomes a canvas to anchor content to, that's a super compute intensive workload. And so some of that wants to be offloaded to the edge, right? Or to the cloud and then, and then sent back to the headset um, for, for the application. So that's gonna be a huge deal for both consumer and enterprise use cases. And the enterprise what's happening is the idea of private 5G, private Mac, which is deployable today, uh, doesn't come with the same constraints and challenges as public 5G. You know, having to send spectrum around buildings and all kinds of crazy stuff and worry about you know public spectrum quite as much. You can actually just take an outpost rack, 
Um, you can take, and by the way, wavelength is just an outpost rack within Verizon's network. Outpost is kind of wavelength. And so drop an outpost rack within a factory floor environment, drop in a 5G packet for uh, service from like an Ericsson or a Nokia, drop in like a 5G radio from an Ericsson or Nokia, and voila, you now have private 5G in your factory floor. If you're tech and you want to go you know, deliver 5G experiences to build out your tractors and trucks. So that's a huge thing. It's going to happen. I, I predict it's, it'll take a year or two for that to maturate, but it's happening now. Yeah, if anyone in, in, in India wants to talk about this, uh, ping me. We have a big team in India um, exploring this. And we have SIs in India like Accenture and others and Cognizant that are, have big XR practices that can go deploy this at scale. I think there was a fantastic article that you did not link in, which was called the NFT Endgame, A Path Towards the Metaverse. And for my audience who don't know about what NFT is, possibly maybe like a, give a brief intro on uh, what NFT is and then maybe what the article says, you know, about how AR, VR, MR, XR can, uh, you know, converge and, you know, then there's the NFT tool which can monetize and create an ecosystem. Mm. Recently, I, I heard this um, this phrase described NFTs and I'm stealing it. Um, with NFTs, the AR VR content becomes a product. And by that, what I mean is that this, the, the, the 3D model we talked about before, right? If you're a retailer and you're creating a, a digital shoe and you're using that shoe to, for e-commerce, or using a 3D model to put on your website or to let someone view on their phone. The, the, the life cycle of that asset isn't very long. And it, it, I think there's other ways to make money off that asset. So what if you could take that 3D asset and extend the life cycle? What if you could take that 3D, that digital asset, and turn it into uh, a product? And that's what NFTs do by basically um, allowing you to tokenize that 3D file, if you will, right, with a, with a blockchain. It becomes a token on a blockchain. And if you think about fungible tokens like Bitcoin and Ethereum, fungible tokens um, are like a rupee or a dollar, right? One dollar, this dollar and this dollar are the same. It doesn't matter if we exchange them. Non-fungible tokens are the opposite in that they're unique. Um, they can't be exchanged for another. Uh, they have provenance. They have history to them, right? They also, there's, there's metadata associated with who owned it, where it went, where it lived, where it was hosted previously. Um, and most importantly, that it creates scarcity. Right, so this non-fungible token creates a unique digital scarce object that uh, <laughs> off of which so many use cases can be spun off of it. Right, um, a good example I like to use is you know you you see back to the shoe example, you see Nike. Uh, Nike has it, you, you, they have Air Jordans in Fortnite, the game. Right, your avatar can wear your little Air Jordans in Fortnite, but you don't own those. Air Jordans. Those are just a string of data living on a server that Epic uh, controls. And if you want to go to Roblox or if you want to go to Minecraft and you want to have an avatar go to these worlds, that 3D model of a shoe can't come with you either. So with NFTs, the promise is that these AR, VR, 3D assets can now be owned by users. They can be brought into various game worlds. Uh, they can be collected and traded. And I think the biggest thing I didn't mention in my uh, rambling of NFTs is with scarcity, with uniqueness, with ownership comes value, right? So these things now have value, just like art has value in the real world, just like Air Jordan collectibles have value in the real world, even though no one actually wears them, they just collect them. Now digital assets can have value due to their scarcity. And that scarcity, again, is proven, and the ownership is proven by a blockchain. So you're seeing most of the NFT adoption and creation happening on top of Ethereum. Um, you know, some of the some of the more AR, VR focused NFT type of platforms. Um, you look at a company like Terra, Terra Virtua. Um, they're they're building out uh, a really compelling um, experience focused NFT solution. And, and so that's where AR VR comes into play. So my article talks about is that it's awesome to have NFTs, uh, which Another way to think of them, it's just a certificate of ownership, right? And I can show you that certificate on my phone or I can show you a JPEG on my phone. And that's interesting. And it's a social signal I can give off that I'm cool and I'm hip and I'm into the new tech trends. And maybe it's a signal that I'm rich because I spent $69 million on a Beeple NFT, which happened, right? This Christie's auctioned off the Beeple NFT to $69 million. 
um, people are buying uh, crypto punks, which are literally pixelated heads of uh, little cartoon characters uh, that look like punks. And they're, go- they're the top few are selling for like seven, five, six, you know, multiple millions of dollars. <laughs> it's madness. But I can't do anything with it. Right. I can't really show it off in a cool way. So, so my, my, the article talks about, um, that, you know, if NFTs really explode and get widely adopted is they need an experience layer. I need to be able to bring you into my virtual gallery. Maybe I'll drop that NFT on the table as a hologram. I need to be able to get immersed in a set in my gallery. Um, maybe I can build a gallery in a virtual world and the gallery itself is an NFT. Which is what you're seeing in other platforms like Decentraland and Sandbox. These are kind of Roblox, Roblox like microverses, right? There's the metaverse idea, and there's the microverses of these kind of isolated virtual worlds. And um, yeah, people are people are buying virtual real estate as NFTs in Decentraland. Um, people are minting, you know, the swords and guns and skins as NFTs in these game worlds, which have, of course, parallels to ARVR. And Decentraland has ambitions to become a, a fully immersive virtual reality type of world. Um, but this whole NFT thing, it extends far beyond games and collectibles and art and kind of like media and entertainment assets. It, it, you know, people, you can start to tokenize with NFTs physical things. And that's where things get really interesting and, re- and weird. Um, you can tokenize real physical real estate. You can tokenize, um, uh, you can tokenize you know, fashion goods and actual physical, re- physical art as well. Um, and even blend it to you have a physical version and a digital version. We're seeing that happen in, in the world of like, uh, NFT shoes. So I'm bouncing around. Hopefully that gives you a good overview of kind of what NFTs are and where they fit in this world. Um, but yeah, I, I think, and, and I think what my paper talked about is, you know, NFTs need an experience layer. And when that happens, NFTs are going to be what really beckons this, uh, beckons in this vision of the metaverse, um, in which, uh, people can actually go and live a life that very much mirrors the light, the light, the life they live in the real world. Right. Uh, and that all comes down to the ability to own something. And, and, and ownership is the kind of the, the key, the key term there, because in the physical world, all the systems we depend upon really stem from ownership, right? You, you think about back to the hunter gatherer days and to the medieval times, right? Um, it, you know, governments and, and kings and kingdoms kind of sprung up with militias and armies because the people needed protection of what they owned. Um, and you needed laws and regulations to govern how ownership and property, um, was, was dealt with. And so you, but, but the problem is you needed these third party entities, these governments to, um, to control how ownership works, not just ownership of property or ownership of your village or your, your castles or your, um, livestock, if you will. Uh, but even ownership of your, of your wealth with like currencies, right? And, and so, you know, today currencies and stores of value are all very much mostly governed by governments. Um, but with NFTs and with cryptos, the, 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 the thesis is that now you, the owner can own things yourself. And now it's software and code that is, uh, smart contracts that are implementing the ownership and those laws and systems. You don't need these other physical entities out there in the world. And so now in the metaverse, these things can become deployed at scale and it becomes a tech utopia is, is the hope, right? Largely as how we know the world is, it, it, it's, a, uh, it, it's a capitalist world. It, it's run by these big institutions, the bankings, and for the longest term, uh, longest time, We've had the financial currency and these banks and everyone who, who running this ecosystem. Now there has been, you know, there's this blockchain which says it, it can create a decentralized future. Would those big organizations who have made all their bounties from the capitalist world, which has created such an unequal world, would they be 
would they welcome something like this would they finally break the walls where you know the, then these the, the the nfts the cryptos the blockchains and the digital world could cre- create a a a, a cohesive la- layer question about the big tech companies and how you know what role do they play in this world in this future it's such a good question now on one hand you can you can think that the tech companies are screwed and that they're going to get disrupted and left in the dust. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, you're, you're already seeing companies like Microsoft and even Amazon and Google, they're, they're all becoming very friendly to open source, right? And they're starting to adopt it and starting to build services and tools around it to make it easier to use. And and, and that's that's all this crypto movement is. It's, 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 it's an open source movement. And I think that I think you're. I don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know how they're going to do it, but I, I no doubt that they're going to start to build services that help um, propel this future forward. I mean, a- Amazon has a service called Amazon Managed Blockchain for Ethereum, right? It, it's a managed service to help you run and manage and deploy your Ethereum nodes, right? And so that's a very complementary role to play. Um, you have Microsoft. Uh, they they have some. They're working with in the Bitcoin community to develop something for identity. With their it was called Sovereign S O V R I N I believe Sovereign, um, and and that's an identity is going to be the absolute central critical thing for the metaverse. The, probably the most critical thing for the metaverse. And there's a company that um, out there called Crucible that has an SDK that's working with Sovereign. Um, to, to allow you to have an avatar uh, powered by Sovereign uh, that you can bring to any game world, right? To Fortnite, to Roblox. So, so those are just some small examples of how these big tech companies are um, are adapting and they're going to play a role, but they're going to have to change their business model dramatically. Do you think these big companies would be able to face off these smaller, nimble, agile startups who possibly in the next few decades, we'll have the same technology which the big tech uh, have. And, and blockchain says that eventually mm, yeah. they will take the middlemen out of the business. Most of the businesses are everything in this world is, is run by middlemen because you know that's that's how things function. But you know when we have something like a Toda IP coming in and, when, and saying that maybe okay we're taking out the middlemen completely out of the picture, but that is is completely no go for all the big tech. How 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 do you see that happening? Oh, it's such a good question. Um, I mean, if you think about Amazon.com, yeah, sure, you can go build a, a website on a blockchain that allows that allows vendors to go on there, have a direct one-to-one relationship and all stuff. Amazon is unique because that's so much physical infrastructure, right? They have so much, all these warehouses and uh, ability, uh, this incredible logistics infrastructure, right? That's not going anywhere. Um, so I think what you're going to see is you're going to see Amazon.com start to open up the infrastructure and they're already doing it in some ways. They, they, they opened, they did, they did that infrastructure in terms of the web and web infrastructure with data centers. And again, this is all me talking, just hypothesis. This is not what, this is not what Amazon is actually plotting. I, I, at least not that I know of, but you can imagine they, they said, Hey, look at our, data center footprint let's open that up and that's because now that's becoming where a lot of ethereum nodes are running um they're already doing it for vendors on uh with with the logistics network they could do the same thing right and, and allow cryptocurrencies crypto assets and create a new a new web interface a new web layer um that's a web three layer that sits on top of their physical logistics infrastructure and that's just amazon um microsoft uh, you know, maybe some, I mean, they're, they're do, again, they're doing a lot with identity in, in the cloud computing space. Um, I don't know what happens to the, the suite of office services in a, in a crypto enabled world. Probably not much. Um, but damn, those things are okay. I can need a reboot, right? Um, you know, I, th- I think it's, it's the companies that are on the social graph, I think, are the, are the ones that are most in trouble. It's the Twitters, the Facebooks, the Snapchats. Uh, 
the, the companies where people are messaging and communicating and exchanging lots of viable, very viable information, the companies are collecting the most viable data on, yeah, Amazon, Microsoft have, have my information data about some shopping stuff, but that's pretty useful. I don't really personally care. Um, it, it's the Facebooks and Twitters that are monetizing my clicks, and my views and all these things. And I get zero value out of it. Right. And this is where, this is where the crypto stuff is going to be incredibly disruptive. And it's going to allow me or you to have an ownership stake in the crypto version of Facebook, the crypto version of Twitter. I make money when I tweet awesome stuff. Right. And, and this, this is where the world changes dramatically. Yes. People talk about, people talk about universal basic income. Maybe that's a thing. Maybe it's needed. Who knows? This, I, in my opinion, this is a much more powerful version of universal basic income. Right. Right. Um, just by tweeting out something, you know, or having a thousand tweets on Twitter, I can earn a hundred bucks on a month or something in, in, in a cryptocurrency because that is the business model of the crypto network. That is how, and, and maybe the coin goes up in value because, um, more people are coming to it due to my tweet. So I'm making money that way. Um, you know what, I, I, Ivan, I'm really sorry for interrupting you over there, you know, but yeah, there's, there's this, this, this second, uh, I mean, what I feel is that eventually, I mean, you know, because, because of the COVID, we've been thrusted into uh, a world where we have to social distance. Now, most of the organizations are looking at social distancing. What, because of that, you know, I mean, they're laying off people. Uh, they're laying off people and they're accelerating automation. What that has done is that they, they have like kind of tasted blood, you know, they have understood that, you know, there's this one machine which can do the work of possibly 10 or 15 people. And these the, the, the machines do not take break, they do not take holidays, they, 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 there is no PF and stuff like that. So automation obviously is, is going to go mainstream in the next few years because that's how businesses work and business is going to make more money because of automation. What that's going to do is going to uh, lay off more and more people. Right. And eventually in the next few decades, maybe when automation really works and maybe machines really get intelligent, we, we won't need human workforce in most of the spaces. What that does is that there's no, there's no, oh, you, you don't need to pay, there's no salaries, there's no jobs. In that world, I see universal basic income coming in play, possibly barter, possibly blockchain, crypto. But till that point of time, it's going to be completely weird. And again, I mean, if you could go go a little bit, talk, you know, more about what really happens to big companies because Facebook has bought, you know, Oculus for $2 billion and they've invested so much over the years. But I see from my perspective, there are smaller startups who are back engineering these uh, devices, repurp adding a layer of something and, and, and selling it and, and that you don't need too much capital. So that's the world that we are getting into and which I don't think bigger organizations are noticing that smaller organizations with little capital, but intent, desire, uh, and who really want an interoperable, decentralized, democratized world, you know, that's the, the new bunch of uh, uh, startups and organizations, I, according to me, are going to be uh, taking over the, so what are your views on something like that? Yeah, I, I think that the smart CEOs of these big companies see this disruption coming and they're disrupting themselves. Right. I mean, Jack Dorsey and Twitter, I think the name of the company, but they're already, they're already working on a decentralized version of Twitter. And, and, and they, they see, and, and Facebook's doing it right with, with the whole Libra association and, and, and the Libra coin. Um, and, um, I mean, I don't think you're going to just see them get completely disrupted. They're, they're, they're too smart. They're, they they were the they were the disruptors right they were the startups that killed the big companies they know what's going on they're very plugged in um and so they're going to adapt or die and um they can change their business model right i'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with what's happening with this idea of like these decentralized autonomous organizations which is a whole different ball game but I think you're going to start to see Facebooks and Twitters and other start to start to experiment with DAOs and um, leveraging um, governance models that are very different than 
the boardroom governance models, right? And it's going to start there. And it's not so much the tech companies that I think need to be worried because, you know, they have good products, they have an audience, they can build new services and new products, and they can build new business models around them. The people that are going to get really screwed over in all this, it's it's the Wall Street, it's the traditional venture capital folks, it's the people that sit on the board and collect that paycheck and have that equity exposure in this old governance paradigm. Um, you know, when it becomes a community that makes decisions in DAOs and open source communities that drive innovation and new features and whatnot, um, and not, you know, the older generation of VCs and Wall Street um, kind of big wigs in the boardroom making these decisions, they're the ones who are going to be <laughs> sitting around scratching their head, wondering what the hell to do with their time. Uh, more so than I think the big tech companies. So that that's just my my take. Uh, they're going to adapt or die. Uh, most will, most will adapt. The savvy ones. Um, I I think one thing to really follow, like a really freaking good example of this, is um, perhaps you saw Twitter. I don't know if they bought or invest, I think they bought. Maybe they just invested in uh, in in Jay Z's company. But people look at that and they're like. And the Wall Street people are like, what WTF, like Jack Dorsey is a lunatic, A, or he's just cozying up with his celebrity buddies like Jay-Z, B, and they don't, but they don't really know what he's up to. And what he's up to, I don't know for sure, but he's trying to build out a platform for creators. They can, and he's looking at new business models, not the traditional Spotify type business model where you take a, a cut and the, the artists oftentimes get screwed but one in which the artists can have more direct relationship with their fans, with NFTs. NFTs allow them to kind of go not direct, you know, how like direct to consumer is a big thing within, you know, e-commerce. This is direct to fan where they don't have to go through a Spotify. They can issue an NFT of their album, of their artwork, whatever it is. And fans can now own the NFT. And they can make money that way. They can collect royalties off those NFTs as that NFT gets transacted. Um, and what's even more interesting is what's happening <laughs> with social tokens. So I don't know if you heard about this, but there, so there, there's there's fungible tokens like Bitcoin and Ethereum, and then there's non-fungible tokens like you know uh, what you see with Crypto Kitties or you know on, on OpenSea or on Nifty Nifty uh, Nifty marketplaces. Um, but what, what artists are trying to do and fans is tokenize the NFT. So you go, you go, you go back to a fungible token, a social token. So let's say that I am, um, an, uh, an artist, I'm a rapper and I have an album, albums, an NFT. I can now break the NFT down into lots of tokens, social tokens. They're now fungible. So the NFT becomes lots of fungible tokens and you know, lots of people that can collect these and, um, and that's how I can monetize this. I can sell those social tokens. The social tokens allow become a, a tool for patro patronage, right? So they call it patronage plus. So now I I'm trying to market myself. What better way than to issue an NFT and then social tokens off the NFT turn you and all your fan all your friends into fans because you own the social token of me and my NFT of my album. You become an evangelist for me, and you become a marketing voice and a proxy for me to help scale my uh, business and I benefit from it. You benefit from it. You make money from it. This is a crazy new world. Instead of UBI, you can make money off just being a fan of me as a rapper. So if I release an album, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty good rapper, by the way. So this, this might happen. Um, uh, you could, we could both you know, get rich off it one day. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Th Ivan, thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry for crossing over the time that you gave me, but really enjoyed having this conversation. I wish I had a couple of more hours with you, you know, because and sit face to face and have a conversation and deep dive into NFT, deep dive into what could happen in the future. But, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, when do we see the like an Amazon e-commerce spatial uh, uh, virtual platform integrated with AR, VR, MR? And could you paint uh, a world or, or the future of the spatial computing, AR, VR, MR. Well, it's already happening, right? I mean, Amazon.com has the view in your room button, right? So you can view 3D models uh, of things you're buying. In terms of AWS, um, I can't speak to everything we're doing, but you know, I would say 
in about a, a year and a half uh, or so, to maybe two years most time, you can expect some announcements and some things that we'll uh, be coming out with. Um, I mean, the, the end game for spatial computing, what everyone talks about um, and what every cloud vendor is going after is this uh, vision of the, the, the AR cloud. A digital twin is a term that gets tossed around way too loosely. Technically, this is not a digital twin. This is more like a 3D map, a 3D map of your library or of my living room or of um, a city or a park. And that 3D map is becomes the canvas upon which you can start to anchor digital experiences. So you, you hear about Pokemon Go. That's not really AR, right? That's this location-based little kind of entertainment on your phone. Um, uh, you can't really put a 3D Pokemon in the world and then walk around it. And, and then we can't, we can't mutually together view that same Pokemon from our own perspectives, right? So how, how do you do that? Uh, the AR cloud is how you do that. The AR cloud becomes a 3D map that is a shared coordinate system that every device can uh, synchronize to so that I, I know that I'm looking at it from this angle, you're looking at it from this angle, and, and my device can recognize where I am in the world and understand where to put that 3D content in the world. So that is the holy grail in AR. That's the future spatial computing. That's where everyone's trying to get to. The, the question is, how the heck do you create that shared 3D map? I mean, you had Google create a shared 2D map and like a flat you know, video type of map, uh, you know, photo type map uh, by sending cars all around the world. Um, that's not going to be very, I mean, that will be an element of how you create a 3D map. But how do you create a 3D map of like the steps walking up to a certain monument in a park and like get the, that, that millimeter level detail of each step? So if I want to have a Pokemon climb up that step, he knows how to do it. How do you do that? There's, that's the, that's the trillion dollar, that's, all, that's the other trillion dollar question. And um, there, there are people have theories and ideas, right? That, that it's most likely going to have to be a crowdsourced version of a map. And what's interesting, back to the crypto stuff, there's a company out there called Foam, F-O-A-M. They're trying to create the future of mapping um, and, and leveraging blockchain and crypto to incentivize people to take their phones out and create a 3D map or create a map in 2D. If they were smart, they'd be doing in 3D too. So you, you so you can get paid for walking out into your, you know, shopping, mapping that environment. So that's another crazy way to make money in the future in this metaverse type of world. This and by the way, the AR cloud is basically the metaverse on top of the real world. Um, but it's going to require crazy amounts of investment infrastructure and maybe even some time to create a shared 3D map of major cities, um, of neighborhoods, etc. Um, the company going after it the hardest right now is, is Niantic. So, so Niantic actually is th that this is their goal, the AR cloud. They're trying to do it with Pokemon Go and they're trying to crowdsource it by having gamers crypto to incentivize people to, to keep on. So you need self-driving cars. You need mobile devices. You need all these things to be synchronized and crowdsourced to create that shared 3D mesh, the 3D map of the world. And you can imagine, you know, very few companies in the world have infrastructure or have enough cameras and scanners out there in the world to do that. And so I'll, I'll end there and let your mind wander from there. But um, the, the, the AR cloud is the end game, along lovely. with NFTs and metaverse. So, lovely. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I hope that Niantic, in fact, if they start in incentivizing the gamers, possibly that could be like one of the roadmaps of creating a shared 3D map. By the way, I think the GTC, uh, NVIDIA announced a partnership with EU for building uh, what they're calling the Omniverse. It's called Destination Earth, where they're trying to map every single part location of. So, so it, it's an exciting space. We are, I think we, we, we just treaded on the path where we understand the next space spatial uh, computing platform is 3D and, and and the opportunity it's going to open up is, is going to be humongous. You know, and thank you for sparing time being part of the show. And to my listeners, if you like what you see in here, please press the subscribe button. Until next time, see you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Really appreciate this. Thank you. Uh, pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we can do it again.